Basketball Talk Pro. Well, uh, we've had two segments now on uh, how to play against penetration. Penetration is always going to be a part of basketball, of course. Number one is to train your players, and you can do this, and you can get very good at it, uh, to be able to play the man with the ball one-on-one. -on -one. Now, uh, I showed you a chart that what's happening right now in the NBA is that uh, they've got a number of ways of penetrating, but the, but the uh, largest way that they penetrate, the most way, uh, is just one-on-one. -on -one. Um, some little form of isolation, sometimes not. It just happens in the flow of the, the game. Uh, so that's, you have to be able to do that. If you can't do that, uh, then you're always going to be trying to make up with a scheme or something like that, disrupting uh, your team. And then the second thing we talked about was going under the screen at the ball. Uh, the reason for this is that p players don't shoot as much off of that ball screen as you would think, and they don't make them uh, a lot. But penetration off of the screen is what's really hurting a lot of teams right now. They're trying to go over to protect against a shot that hardly happens but giving up then penetration, which happens a lot and has been very uh, dangerous uh, to teams. Um, so we prefer the going under. Uh, if you really go under, you don't get hooked up on the screen. And the, event, the defensive man on the screener giving you room to go, go under. Uh, but we allow going over if the dribbler or the man with the ball is going so far from the screen that there's a gap in there that you can work your way through without getting screened. Uh, that was the second way. Now the third way is the zone defense. Uh, I don't usually talk a lot about the zone defense, but uh, there is a place for it. And I've always agreed, agreed with that. Uh, but it will stop penetration. The zone I'm going to show you, or we're going to show you, uh, will stop penetration. But it may open up some other things if you don't, uh, if you're not careful with it. We use the zone defense you're going to see at Orlando for about 80% of the games. But we didn't necessarily use it a lot, but we use it primarily to stop. The, uh, to slow down the rhythm of some of the teams. But we also used it sometimes to uh, help against a team that has uh, a lot of penetration. It was effective. We didn't have to stay in it long. A lot of times you get them out of their rhythm or get them used not to penetrating. And when you go back to man-to-man, -man, they, they play like they're still playing against a a zone, at least uh, for a while. So today we're going to show you that zone. Uh, now, the three things that I've showed you, and everything I show you in this in Basketball Talk Pro, we only we're running 15 to 20 minutes of time. That is not enough time to get a lot of detail in. But I want to remind you, all of that detail is in the book, uh, Basketball's Third Element. Uh, improvisation. Volume 3 has all the offense, all the defense, all the drills uh, with uh, a lot more uh, uh, defined uh, methods of doing it. More detail. The, the, the film I'm going to show you now was made well, some time ago, maybe half a year ago. But I looked at it today and I felt, you know, there's no way I can do any better. Uh, so uh, you'll notice that, that I'm dressed different when you come to the, uh, to the chart. But this is a pretty good detailed uh, description of the rover zone. 
and if you want to play it, which I would recommend you do, uh, get the book, Volume 3. You can buy all three books for less than $20 on Amazon. Uh, so uh, that will help you. But let's go right now to uh, the chart uh, and, the, and the board uh, where you can see how the rover zone is put together. Well, I'll start uh, with this block on, on, my, on my left as I face it. I don't know what, what you're doing when you're watching this. Uh, and I, first of all, I want to show you the, the, the various positions which are not hard and where they cover. Because you have to get in your mind, this is not like playing against a man, a, a man to man. It's like different uh, for the players. They're not guarding the men, but they keep thinking they are. Um, time will help you with that. Uh, practice will help you with that. Well, first of all, this baseline um, drawing right here is approximately eight feet from the end line, give or take. And I'll go into, there's a problem with that, and I'll go into it in just a, uh, a little bit. So these baseline men basically have that baseline area. Any ball out here, this baseline man's got to, got to take to take them. Uh, and I want to just stop a minute and talk about that. The guys get very nervous about this when they see a guy sitting in the corner and chances are there's going to be one there. Uh, they tend to want to creep out, but then that opens up this. They have to be content if the pass is made to that guy that they go as quickly as they can, but here's what they have to be coached a lot on is if this guy is shooting, going for a shot, and you're about halfway, don't try to go all the way to close out on him. I hate the words close out, by the way. Uh, if, the, if you're here, the shot's taken here, and you make a nice high with your hand way up, this guy, remember, he's shooting, focusing on the basket. All he sees is an image, uh, and he doesn't know whether it's here or back here, uh, and that, that controls it. You can contest shots well without being right on, uh, on the person. You have to really get that point across to your players. While the wingmen then uh, get everything from that baseline up all the way up, but it isn't all the way over here. You know, it ends about right here, uh, and they have everything then in this area. Any man that goes into that area with the ball, uh, same thing over here. The rover, his area <clears throat> to start with is wherever your your free throw lines are. You know, the NBA gets wider, <clears throat> but uh, if you're not in the NBA, then you're going to play with the, the line, lane lines you got. So that's uh, where that rover is, is uh, in charge of that area until the ball moves. Then he becomes completely different. Uh, but we don't want him out here guarding a man. We just get around the circle. The same thing with him with him as a baseline man. You don't have to, if this guy's going to be shooting out here for 26, 27 feet um, in NBA, it's a little closer, of course, in, the, <coughs> in, in college and in high school, but they're not NBA players shooting that shot either. So, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, <coughs> But that's his area when the ball's out in, out in front. <coughs> I'll get rid of that cough in just, just a minute. All right, now, after we get those established with our players, those lines, uh, and then the next part of it that, that I do to get them used to playing it is this. We line up, and this lineup 
just like this. And we slowly move the ball past to the wing. Now here's the, where the rover and how the rover plays. He positions himself between the basket and the man and the ball. Uh, not the man, the ball. Uh, if, for example, that position draw if there's a postman there and it draws him into that postman we don't overplay postmen in the zone we don't play behind and we don't play in front this guy has got to be very mobile uh, but you can stand next to this guy and put a hand on I don't know how they're, they're going to throw the ball in there uh, if you do that and that's as, as he has to position according to the ball in the basket. If, he's, if there's a man there, rather than overplay him and play him front or back, play him aside. I'm not so sure you couldn't do that in man man. Uh, but uh, it, it works. Now, when the ball then is passed to uh, the corner, now the baseline man comes up. If he isn't a shooter or isn't going to take a shot, he can play him fairly normal, just like we play all of our positions. A zone position is not played as tight on the ball as a man-to-man -man, uh, position. Um, you're looking to contest these shots. These shots out here, if they're contested, are very poor percentage shot in the NBA. I don't care where you, you where you uh, are playing. They're poor percentage shots when they're un when they're contested. Good shots when they're uncontested. Remember that, and you have less trouble uh, with the zone. Now the baseline man is out. The wing man on that pass he drops in. He just needs to cover as big an area um, for cutters as he can. Oh, he's not worried about this guy. The rover's got that guy. But a lot of times he's going to be sitting right in his lap. Uh, so now uh, the ball goes in, and what we do is stay on one side and change teams. But we go over and over and over back here. They go here, go here, they go here, they go here, they go here. Over and over we do that. And almost every time the ball changes when you start with this, you are making a correction. Somebody's not right. You've got to correct them. Uh, and as they get better at it, probably no corrections. Because um, <clears throat> it's pretty simple. Uh, just remember, Everybody, the last guy with this pen, you know, can find all kinds of weaknesses, especially in his own. Uh, because there are holes there, there are gaps there, uh, especially in 2-1-2s and regular zones. But we always have a man guarding those gaps and holes by having him there uh, in, in the uh, position. The ball goes there. He should probably be here because he's got to take, he's got to be here too. He's got to be in position, the ball and the basket. Rovers do not like to go deep at first, but they'll learn to get deep if you will do your job. Uh, these guys are not, you know, they didn't make this defense, so they're learning every day uh, that, you, that you play it. Now, uh, I'm hoping that was, that was helpful, um, but that's what we do. And then we flip it over on the other side and do it on the other side. Then tomorrow we come out and do it on that other two sides. And eventually, maybe two or three days, if you're doing this right, you begin to play it live. Um, but otherwise, I prefer to just work on those passes uh, and make them adjust to them and make them uh, be less afraid of them, uh, be less concerned uh, about them. 
But there are some problems, like there is with anything. Here's one problem, and you know, any coach, and unless he's you know limited in some way intellectually, uh, we'll see right away what we're talking about. With the rover down here and the ball in the corner and a pass then, if a guy's standing out here, is very easy to make. We know that. But you will be surprised if you have a good rover uh, that uh, he can get there more times than you think. Because this pass generally is not a real sharp pass out there. It has to go over a lot of people. Uh, so it's a slower pass. An alert guy can, can, uh, can do this. While we're on the rover, let me tell you, you're going to wonder who, what kind of player that plays there. Well, the ideal player is number one has quickness, number two has length. Now, the best rover that we've ever had, or I've ever had, was bullet-like quick, but was not big. But he, he's the best rover that I've ever seen. It was a kid in China. And uh, really a good athlete, good player. And boy, he just covered everything. He, he covered up everything. And he was a very intelligent player. So he caught on to all of the little innuendos that I, I had to work with most guys on. But there's another way you can use the rover. This is relatively simple, what he does. If you have a player that you want in the lineup, but he's a bad defensive player, put him in the rover spot. That may sound different, funny to you, but that's what we did. When I was with Orlando, we had a guy who was a great three-point shooter, uh, and he could really help us offensively. He didn't start, but we put him in the game, but his defense was just terrible, uh, and it became a liability. When we played zone, we could bring him in because we'd play him at the rover. Because this is not hard. Uh, these positions are much harder. So, the pass is made. He comes, because that's his job to get there. Uh, but he can't make it. Let's say he can't make it. He gets bumped or something like that. Very simple adjustment. At first, I was a little bit afraid of it. But it, 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 players have been able to handle it so well, I'm not, not afraid at all anymore. This wingman's just got to be alert. He covers. The rover becomes the wingman, and they stay there. Don't try to sit, move them back. It's not a big problem. This guy can learn to play it just as easily as this. This is simple for the rover. So. We just make that adjustment if he can't make it. Um, a lot of times he can make it. The other situation is uh, at the wings is the cross-court pass. Uh, this takes a little bit of time with your rover. Uh, say he's here where he should be, uh, lined up like that, uh, and the baseline man is maybe the baseline men should cover any cutters into the middle, by the way. But they shouldn't go across the middle. In other words, take them to here and switch them off. The zone has to do that all the time, uh, whatever zone you're playing. But don't just sit there and let guys cut in. Cutting in and penetration is what hurts you with the zone. Everybody thinks it's a three-point shot. I don't feel that way. I think it's move, uh, drives and cuts. Uh, the rover stops most of that. But the baseline men have to be alert as well as the wingman. Here comes the cross-court pass. It's really a simple adjustment. He, but he, what he tends to do is come out here and then go over there. He's got to be trained to when that cross-court pass. He just goes across the lane and he can get in that position. The wingman has no trouble getting out there because uh, all he's looking for is penetration and, uh, and cutters in here. Uh, he's got no other 
really roll uh, when it's on the weak side. So he just covers them up, Rover takes his position, and then we're ready. Uh, and that's what, you know, we work on. There's so one couple other things. Uh, here's a weakness, a problem. Ball's here, and they line up two big guys right with your baseline man. Almost invariably what happens is the baseline men, uh, you know, are, are kind of half falling asleep. When the ball's at the top, we have a very stringent rule. When the ball's at the top, the baseline men play, overplay hard anything that comes in their area. It's a, we cannot allow this pass. That's a killer. Uh, it just it distorts our, our zone uh, because we don't have a rover on, on that play because it's taken by, uh, by the ball. So we are very tough on this. If there's any man in your area, you've got to overplay him when the ball's out in front. Not true when the ball's on the side, but when the ball's out in front, you've got to be aggressively overplaying. But remember, that takes a big pass and also you've got the backboard. Uh, sticking out. And if these two wingmen will play with their hands wide when the ball's out there, see they take a lot of, of the passing lane uh, down. Uh, so that's really all there is to the zone. Uh, and yet uh, we've had really, really good success with it. When I was in Orlando, I think we played it almost every game for a little while. But we d used it right. We used it to slow them down. But there were nights, and I can remember them, when uh, again, for some reason, whatever, t we, were, we were not allowing scoring by the other team. They were missing and they weren't, they were slowed up and they were walking around and trying to, they uh, looked utterly confused uh, to me. And so we might let it go for 10, 12, 13 uh, possessions. The other time uh, when we're talking about use of it is, you know, that guy at Syracuse convinced me of one thing. If this is all you play, you get good at it. Uh, he built his system, total system, around a 2-1-2 zone. But he's very good at it. Uh, they get very, very uh, good at it. Paul Westhead was with, with uh, us when we used his zone. He corrected me, uh, you know, two or three times every day. Uh, but I get a call from him after we're both gone, uh, and he's calling to thank me for this zone he was playing in the WNBA, and he was playing in the finals, the championship round. He won it, uh, playing this whole game. But he built it around that, that uh, zone. So, the thing, you, you, there's some, you, you have to kind of learn the adjustments that you got to make. I can't do that in, in 15 uh, minutes, but the, the big thing is you got to practice it. There's no drills for this other than the one I showed you. That's all you've got to do. Uh, learn, teach them how to shift. Well, uh, I think we've covered everything. If you have questions about it, if you like it, I know the last time I showed it, a lot of the guys went to it, a lot of the coaches went to it, they had a lot of good comments about it, uh, but I don't show this very often. Uh, but I thought, it's time uh, for, you know, this, this uh, number of people watching revolve constantly and it was time for me to show it again, especially uh, uh, people that, you know, feel they have a need from a, a, a zone. But don't ever play zone because you, uh, you don't want your players to foul out. Uh, and never play zone because you think the other team is so much superior to you. They're not going to play any better in the zone than they play in a man-to-man. -man. Uh, 
is. So, you know, this is not a, uh, it's a cover up for weakness. There is no cover up for weakness. Uh, and so, use it the way it's meant to be used. And I think you'll have some success with it. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.